Today's episode is brought to you by Heifer International. If you're looking for the perfect holiday gift for everyone on your list, know that just one goat from Heifer International can provide a whole family with nutritious milk. A gift of an animal from Heifer increases access to education, empowerment, and dignity. And the more gifts you buy, the more families you can help. It's an easy way to give gifts that really matter to all your friends and family. This is no ordinary gift. Learn more at heifer.org slash grammar. That's heifer.org slash grammar. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. I have a meaty middle about delicious words with an interesting origin and a tidbit about the phrase lock, stock, and barrel. Here we go. Most people like chocolate, but most of us probably don't know from which language the English word originates. Take a guess. Perhaps you thought of Spanish, because the word chocolate in that language is chocolate. Sorry, that's not right. However, Spanish speakers who encountered the Aztecs do have something to do with it. Keep listening to learn about a few English words that come from an Aztec language. Nahuatl. Nahuatl is one of 62 individual languages in the udo aztecan family, and it's spoken today by about half a million people in central and northern Mexico. It was spoken in the city of Tenochtitlan when Hernán Cortés conquered the Aztecs in 1521. In the early 16th century, the Aztec Empire, also known as the Mexica Empire, had control of about 5 to 6 million people. Now, back to chocolate. You might have heard that the famous Aztec leader Montezuma consumed chocolate, but he did so in a very different way than a modern person who might nibble on a chocolate bar. The English word chocolate entered our language between 1595 and 1605. It comes from the Nahuatl word chocolatl, spelled X-O-C-O-L-A-T-L. This Nahuatl word comes from chococ, which means sour, bitter, plus atl, which means water. This origin gives us a clue as to how the Aztecs used chocolate. It was a bitter drink brewed with cocoa beans. It was a frothy beverage, and it seemed that Montezuma added vanilla and spices to it. The Aztecs weren't the first to use chocolate, though. The Olmec people, who lived in Mesoamerica, first cultivated cacao plants around 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. They believed that chocolate had mystic qualities. Interestingly, the Latin name for the cacao tree means food of the gods. The Olmec passed on knowledge of the cacao plant to the Maya, who then passed on a liking for chocolate to the Aztecs. And then the Spanish came. Spaniards spread the use of chocolate to other Europeans who modified it for their tastes, until it became the chocolate that we typically enjoy today. The first modern chocolate bar appeared in 1847, when the British company J.S. Fry & Sons created one using cocoa butter, cocoa powder, and sugar. Various other food-related words come from Nahuatl. One is avocado, which originates from the Nahuatl word ahucatl. The English word avocado was first used in English around 1690. Another food word that comes from Nahuatl is tomato, which comes from the similar-sounding Nahuatl word tomato. This first came into English in about 1595. Chili also comes from Nahuatl. The Nahuatl word chile, as you might guess, means chili pepper. All of these words might be making you think of guacamole, a word that also comes from Nahuatl. In that language, it's something like awacamole. The beginning part of this word is the Nahuatl word for avocado, as we've seen. The second part, mole, means sauce. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the yummy concoction called guacamole, it's a Mexican dip made of avocado, tomato, onions, and spices, and maybe lemon or lime. Another famous Mexican dish is mole, which contains a flavorful sauce made of various ingredients, including chocolate, chilies, and spices. Now let's switch gears from food to animals. Can you think of some creatures that might have roamed around the Aztec Empire? A coyote might have. In Nahuatl, this animal is called the coyotl. English speakers began using this word in about 1825. Another animal word with a Nahuatl origin is the now endangered ocelot. It was known as the oseyotl, which translates as jaguar. 
An ocelot is not the same as a jaguar, although they might look similar. The scientific name of an ocelot is Leopardus pardalis, whereas that of a jaguar is Panthera anca. Before we finish and perhaps go to eat some chocolate or guacamole, I want to mention one other animal word that comes from the Nahuatl language. You might have heard of the mythic Aztec serpent god Quetzalcoatl. In Nahuatl, coatl means snake. Although the Quetzalcoatl is not a real animal, the Quetzal is. This brightly colored bird is the national bird of Guatemala. We hope you enjoyed going back a few centuries to see how an Aztec language contributed some words that we regularly use in English. That segment was written by Bonnie Mills, who is clearly trying to torture me with all these difficult-to-pronounce words. She is also the author of The Curious Case of the Misplaced Modifier, who blogs at sentencesleuth.blogspot.com. Next, we'll learn about the origin of an interesting phrase. Have you ever talked about doing something lock, stock, and barrel? If so, you meant you were doing something in its entirety. You might have said you were cleaning everything out of your closet, lock, stock, and barrel. Or that you had to empty everything out of your bag, lock, stock, and barrel, when you went through airport security. You may have used this idiom for years without knowing its origin. And you might be surprised to know that the three words in this phrase refer to the three parts of a gun— Picture an old-fashioned musket, the kind used in the American Revolution. The lock is the firing mechanism. That's the part of the gun where a match or spark was used to ignite gunpowder. The flash of gunpowder would ignite the main charge in the gun, which would propel a musket ball forward. The stock is the thick wooden end of a gun. Picture a Minuteman nestling the butt of his musket into the crook of his shoulder. That part's the stock. Finally, the barrel is the long cylindrical part of the gun. That's the tube down which a bullet travels. The first known use of this term in a metaphoric sense is in a letter written by Sir Walter Scott in 1817. In describing a broken fountain he wanted to put in his garden, he wrote that, quote, Like the Highlandman's gun, she wants stock, lock, and barrel to put her into repair, unquote. In other words, nearly every part of it needed to be fixed. A variation of this phrase that's now obsolete is horse, foot, and artillery. These items referred to the components of an army. The horse is the cavalry, the foot is the soldiers, and the artillery is the weaponry, be it bows, catapults, or howitzers and rockets. In one of the Anne of Green Gables books, Anne is described as peppering her teacher with impossible questions. Quote, and routed her horse, foot, and artillery, unquote, the narrator writes. In other words, Anne destroyed her entirely, depleting every ounce of self-possession she had. So that's your tidbit for today. Lock, stock, and barrel refers to the three parts of a gun, and the expression means the entire thing. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl, and hearing that Walter Scott was the first person who used the phrase lock, stock, and barrel made me want to tell you about the amazing Scott monument I saw in Edinburgh, Scotland last summer. We were on the grounds of Edinburgh Castle, which is on a big hill looking out over the entire city, and one thing that really stood out was this massive, tall, black Gothic tower, which the signs said was a monument to the Scottish writer Sir Walter Scott. We walked over and looked at it more, and it's hard to emphasize how impressive it was. We didn't have a lot of time, but I looked up more about it when I got home. At more than 200 feet tall, it's the largest monument in the world that honors a writer. It has 64 statues that are based on characters from Scott's novels, and if I ever go back, I'm going to try to find them. If you get a chance to go, be more prepared than I was and read a Walter Scott novel and then spend some time at the Scott Monument climbing up to the top and looking at the statues. And if you never go but are curious, a few people have made videos of themselves visiting that I found on YouTube, and people have also uploaded photos to Flickr so you can get a sense of what it looks like. And thank you to Edinburgh for being a city that seems to value your writers. 
Grammar Girl is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and you can find my work and that of everyone else in the network at quickanddirtytips.com. If you're still looking for holiday gifts, I have two things that might fit the bill. I have a 2018 tip-a-day calendar called the Grammar Daily and a cute little book called the Grammar Devotional that has tips and puzzles and cartoons, something for every day of the year. So it's like a calendar you can keep. Both are available at all the online bookstores and physical bookstores can order them for you. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.